discussion is on Chinese and Indian businesses implications of going global. I mean, looking at it uh, from the point of view of the kind of presentations that are going to be before you, I, I, I was uh, uh, thinking that there are really probably three or four large issues here, which I hope the panel will discuss. One is uh, how serious is this in the sense that when we talk about Chinese and Indian businesses going global, how are the numbers compare with, uh, let's say, European companies going global, US companies going global, or are we looking at just a region of now, Russian companies going global? Are we looking at just a, are we looking at numbers in a global context, or are we just looking at uh, it because uh, India and China going global is such a, such a new thing? I think that is one part. The, the, the second thought is why? Why is this globalization happening? Is it because individual companies are seeking to extend their, their frontiers in because of their particular, I would say, corporate competences? Uh, uh, focus on areas which are become global rather than local, in which case that they have to extend their sources of supply and sources of markets from the beginning to the end. And therefore, it's important for them to grow, grow global. So it's a natural progression of, I would say, development and growth of business. Or is it because there is a, a, a state-run or, or a larger agenda of really seeking natural control over natural resources? Is that an agenda? If, that, if there is an agenda, is that agenda common for both the countries, common for China and common for India? And if there are differences, why are there, why are there uh, differences? And third, at a, at, a, at, a, at a lower level, the question is that is the behavior of the of these companies, the Chinese companies and Indian companies, what is the commonality? What is the difference in the behavior of these companies when they seek to extend their influence in the market overseas? I'm sure that we will be getting answers to all these. And to start off the discussions, we have uh, uh, Amitendu to give us a, a, a kind of a macro picture. Dr. Amitendu Palit is head of uh, partnership and program here with us at ISIS. And he's an economist who has a lot of comparative economic studies, political economy of international trade, regional development, and public policies. He worked in the Ministry of Finance for a decade and was with ICREA and, and also was on advisory committees with the Planning Commission and ILO. And more importantly, he has currently uh, already published one book on China-India economics, uh, on special economic zones in India, as well as his, his uh, forthcoming book is on a very, very important topic, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, he has several publications in leading academic journals. So I would, uh, I would, without further ado, turn to Amitendu to start the discussions going. Can I request that uh, perhaps the, the panelists could speak for about 15 minutes each? That will leave us enough uh, uh, room for discussions. Thank you. Do you want to carry this? Join uh, uh, Dr. Narayan, my colleague Chandrani, and uh, 
my uh, co-conspirator, uh, Dr. Vikas Kumar, who is either in a taxi or on his way there, Kavre are climbing uphill into the campus uh, from the EMIRG for welcoming you all here to what is uh, the first of the uh, joint activities between the Institute of South Asian Studies and the National University of Singapore and the Emerging Market Internationalization Research Group at the University of Sydney, under which uh, we are having this program for one and a half day. Uh, the first part is today, which is a panel discussion, as you all know, and tomorrow there is going to be a workshop where we have uh, at least 14 presentations, very uh, rigorous, intensive presentations that are going to be on tomorrow. So, let me, uh, without further ado, uh, get on to this uh, presentation. And I think what what uh, Dr. Narayana mentioned at the beginning. Can you switch these slides up right on top? Just the ones. Just those ones, just a moment. I think I'll take a slightly broader macro view of the subject. And I start with this uh, rather tantalizing uh, title, Capital Exports by China in India Features and Issues. Now, why I call this tantalizing is because India and China are not traditionally known as capital exporters. They're known as capital importers, recipients of capital rather than exporters of capital. But things uh, like in uh, many other uh, spheres of the world have started changing and one of this I'll very quickly take you through some numbers. These are the outward foreign direct investment from the two countries and we look at the trends beginning from 1990. In the 1990 you hardly see the bars at all. They are barely raising their heads above the sea level, they're almost there. But come 2005, they have st suddenly started becoming aggressive and they have started rising fast so much so that when you reach towards the end of the last decade, these bars have actually started becoming pretty tall. And obviously, China is far ahead when it comes to the total outward area it blows, which was more than 80 billion doses from China in the year 2012. Uh, India, which is the green bar, has kind of gone into a circular trajectory which is connected to its own domestic performance and the larger global turnaround in the business cycles. And the interesting part of this story is also the fact that they are, when I say they, investors from both countries and as we will soon get to see, uh, the major multinationals or the transnationals as we call them, they're engaging in a large heterogeneous activity of mergers and amalgamations across the world. They are buying assets. They are getting into collaborations. They are picking up stakes from other businesses across the world. And let me welcome Dr. Vikas Kumar. So, uh, I hope the green. Because I hope all is well. So uh, this is the cross-border MA cultures situation. Again, as you see, 2005 onward, a sharp pickup in the number of MA purchases. The numbers uh, here, is, here are the values, uh, rather impressive again, and it's all sort of beginning to converge at the middle of the last year, 2004-2005, that's from when uh, the aggression displayed by the uh, multinationals from both countries, these are the Greenfield FDI projects which are basically the fresh uh, investments made by multinationals from both countries, again, speaking sharply. 
Now, this is a chart which shows the hundred, which shows the Chinese and Indian multinationals, which are featuring among the hundred top non-financial multinationals in the world from developing countries. Hundred top non-financial multinational corporations from developing countries and transition economies prepared by the accountant. And let me also share with you that this group of developing economies and transition economies that the UN prepares includes countries like Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Brazil, Russia, and so on and so forth. So we are actually talking about a fairly diverse, large group of industrialized emerging markets. Out of these, you get these many companies, the firms, which are figuring among the top 100. Obviously, the number of Chinese companies are low. When we look at a company like CITIC, Citic, for example, Citic is number two on this list. This is a ranking on the basis of foreign assets pulled by these companies. Citic is number two on this list, but Citic also figures in the list of top 100 global transnational corporations across the world. Similarly, China Ocean Shipping Group also figures in that list. Citic is somewhere in the 30 to 40 range, and the China Ocean Company is probably between the 70 and 80 range. As you come down and see the rest of the companies from India, the most prominent company is the Tata. The Tata Steel Limited and the Tata Motors Limited. As you go down towards the bottom, we have the Reliance Communications Limited. There are familiar names like, uh, let's say, Lenovo from China, China Mobile. Uh, again, the Tata Consultancy Services comes in from India. It's an interesting group where you do have state-owned enterprises and large private conglomerates all bunched together. So this is, in fact, a reflection of the characteristics of the multinationals that have increasingly become dominant players. These are the ones who are actually becoming the large vehicles of capital export from China and India. Now let's look at the snapshots and outcomes. The specifics of multinational behavior would be dealt in at length by both Klaus and Chi. But I just wanted to take you through a few issues of this development. The first is China and India has clearly emerged as capital exporters during the last decade. Now, the reflection of this, when we look at what manifests this process, is the fact that multinational corporations from both countries are active in mergers and acquisitions and also fresh investments in different parts of the world. Why are they doing so? There are a whole stock firm specific factors which is driving them into this. It would be the desire to seek strategic assets, access to natural resources, capitalizing on existing brands, like say, for example, the Tata's acquisition of the Jaguar, and getting a position in regional value chains by picking up strategic assets. And there could be another variety of issues. But all of these, and the fact that these corporations have become major exporters of capital, have had an impact upon the way China and India approach their external trade negotiations. And that is a fairly significant point. There was a time when China and India had a very <coughs> defensive approach to signing bilateral investment treaties across the world. And the reasons for that are several, we will come to that. But this approach is gradually changing. And one of the reflections of that is, if one looks at the free trade agreements that China and India have been signing over the last decade, it's a significant departure from the fact that while their earlier free trade agreements would focus primarily on goods and tariff liberalization, now these agreements have come to cover a lot of investment related issues. And that is a clear signal of the fact that both countries are beginning to accept the trade and investment relationship from the point of view of the fact that they themselves are beginning to earn greater returns on the capital which they are exporting in other parts of the world. And both have to that extent become far more what we call open in their negotiations because now the 
imperative of protecting the interests of their indigenous tenancies in other country markets is a strong imperative. And one of the most recent manifestations of that is China agreeing to start negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty with the United States of America on an approach which is actually technically the US regulatory approach. This is something on which China had been opposed to for a very long time. And this is something for which the negotiations which had started in 2007 got stalled for a period of five years. But now China has gone into these negotiations with a very different approach. There are technical features like China is approaching this with a negative list approach. It is happy to give what we in technical terms call pre-establishment status for MFN and national treatment in this process. For me, I think a very interesting feature that will gradually emerge as we go ahead is this area called investor-state disputes and how China and India approach this. What do we mean by investor state disputes? And this is basically where I'm going to end. Investor state disputes are provisions which are included in regional trade agreements or bilateral agreements or even in bilateral investment treaties, which give foreign investors the right to initiate arbitration against the states where they have invested. If the states commit themselves to action, which they are not supposed to. Usually under traditional circumstances, this was supposed to be expropriation of assets and related matters. But now, after WTO and after a lot of development in investment related matters, the whole gamut of industry state dispute domain has changed. China and India have never been keen on strong investor state dispute mechanisms. And the reason was very simple. As long as both countries were primarily net capital importers, they always felt that strong investor state, uh, investor state dispute provisions would give the other country foreign investors a greater right to act against their own states. But now gradually those views are changing because now they are becoming increasingly conscious of the fact that the interests of their own multinationals and corporations in other countries have to be protected. And this is going to be reflected in all the future FTAs and RTAs that the countries are signing. And this will actually see both these countries implanting more of the US and European Union regulatory characteristics in the FTAs which they are going to sign. Because investor state disputes and strong provisions to that extent are very common features in all the bilateral and regional agreements that the US signs and the EU signs. So we are expected to see more of these features coming in. The FTAs that China and India will sign in future, the challenge for them in this regard will be to how to manage these particular characteristics with their own domestic regulations and the existing bilateral investment treaties which they have signed because on a number of occasions there are large inconsistencies between them. So this is one of the startling features of their becoming capital exposures which is influencing their external trade negotiation strategies. We'll be happy to discuss more on this later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you on that. Uh, large picture, large issues uh, approved. And we have now uh, Professor Klaus Meyer, uh, a PhD from the London Business School and an MA from the University of Birmingham, with research interests in the strategies of foreign investors in emerging economies, and teaching interests in strategy management international business. He has a He's professor, joined CIBS in 2011, and he has been professor of strategy at the University of Bath since 2007. And now he holds a position of adjunct professor at the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, his research 
focuses on strategies of multinational enterprises in emerging economies, and in particular, interest rate how firms adapt their business strategies to specific conditions in each emerging economy. He has published a number of uh, uh, journal articles and a book. He's a book review editor at the Journal of International Business Studies. And he has been serving as track chair for the conferences of the Academy of International Business in Beijing, here in Tokyo, and Okay. Nagoya. Uh, I would like to use my introductory remarks to make three statements or point out three features about especially Chinese multinationals, which is what I have been focusing on, but we can talk about the comparison between Chinese and Indian as we go along. Three observations are, firstly, they are early stages of the internationalization. And that means they're also at early stages of learning processes on how you do international business, even though they're actually relatively big in terms of the resources they have, because either because they have dominant market positions at home or because they're supported by the state. The second feature is that they very frequently use what we call strategic asset seeking acquisitions. That means they buy assets overseas, they take over companies overseas, not just because they want to get a strong position in that particular market or that particular market part of the world, but we want to say, I want to take those assets uh, and strengthen their competitive position in their home market because the fastest growing market where the Chinese companies really want to succeed is still China, but the overseas investments may help them with that. That's what I think is the strategic asset seeking about. And the third is the role of the state as supporter of many of those companies, especially in China, but also in some other emerging markets. In terms of the data, um, Nintendo has already talked about data. Unsurprisingly, my data show the same pattern. That is a big jump in, starting 2005 uh, to 2007, and it continues despite the financial crisis. We are on a high level. These numbers in 2011-12 is about 10% of global FDI flows. So that sort of answers the question about how important is this in the, in the global context. I mean, 10% are these countries together. So I've, the other point I'd like to emphasize is the emergence of China and India. China is red here, India is green, is part of a bigger picture of emerging economy multinationals playing a bigger role in the global economy. So you have Russian companies here, you have even Malaysia, you have Chile, you have Mexico, right? So it's, and Thailand is also somewhere it's this one, right? So it, there's a broader trend happening. Now, these numbers are from the UNCTAD uh, FDI database, and they're really based on balance of payments. But I think that's something we should um, reflect over for a minute. Balance of payment captures capital flows. So if a company transfers capital overseas to make an investment, that's capital. If an Indian company has a subsidiary in Europe, or is even registered in Europe as a European company, and raises capital in the European market to make an acquisition, that would be captured by balance of payment data, at least not as a capital outflow from India. Therefore, these balance of payment numbers have their limitations. And uh, that may explain why India is so much smaller than Russia, because Indian companies may be quite good, you know, happy to raise capital in European or American markets, in Russia, they try to use FDI to basically for capital flight reasons. So that, there are biases in these data. That's, I think, important to recognize. But what, I think what we can say is there is this big increase, right? Now, I said that my first statement was Chinese companies at early stages. This is my interpretation of internationalization process model. Companies need to learn how to do business internationally. Um, they do so through experiment, experiential learning, through well, learning by doing, by actually being involved in the international business. That they build capabilities. These capabilities help them to recognize opportunities, assess risks, and they reduce the, the, the marginal cost of future expansion. And then they make the next commitment. That's so. That's a traditional way of thinking of internationalization as a process of stepwise internationalization. Now, in, in, we take this perspective, the companies we're talking about are in relatively early stages. 
right? And that means their strategies are designed to facilitate learning. Even the Tata takes over uh, Tetley. One of my friends took inter interviewed some people. They said, well, there wasn't really much integration and so on, but the Tata people felt they learned a lot about how m and is done, in, are done internationally, right? So the learning is always important. What do I mean with international business? When I talk to my Chinese colleagues, I always tell them, well, you will make mistakes, and I can predict which mistakes you're doing, because I can see, or you can see, the mistakes the Europeans did in China. The Europeans have problems getting along with the government, understanding why is the party important. They don't know why Guanxi or networks are important. They don't know how to deal with the Chinese legal system, and so on. Now, you can turn this around and you say the Chinese will make mistakes. They don't know, they don't know how to deal with media. A Chinese company coming to Europe or US, they don't know how to deal with a journalist because they have no experience. And they don't have a point of reference. It's not like, if you go abroad, you know you have to learn another language. But if something is not on your mental map, you don't study it, right? That's why media, trade unions. Okay, you take your dictionary and you figure out what, how, what trade unions translates into Chinese. And it, doesn't tell you what the trade union is in the US or in Europe. Similar issues dealing with authorities, dealing with consumers. That's sort of what it, this international business knowledge is about, that, that these companies have to build up. Some of it is specific to each country, right? You need to learn how to deal with German trade unions when you go to the UK and the trade unions are different, that sort of thing or well, the British media are different than the German media to some degree. But there are some things that are general, like how to manage an M&A and on a, how to do due diligence when you do uh, overseas acquisition. So there are different ways companies can build it. Traditionally, we focus on experiential learning. That's the internal process. But for small companies, this learning also to a large extent happens within networks. Small companies operate within net networks of business. Now, for Chinese and Indian companies, because their home countries are very network-oriented societies, these networks are also important. More so than in companies of equal size from Anglo-Saxon countries. But there are other ways you can bring in people with international experience to your top management. A lot of Chinese companies actually learned about how to do international business because they were previously partnered to a foreign investor coming to their country, and so they, that's how their learning process started. You can imitate other companies uh, and uh, last and least, you can uh, acquire other companies. Which brings me to the second point, which is about the strategic asset seeking. These are some data from a survey done by colleagues from in, uh, at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And they asked the companies, why do you invest overseas? And you see from the numbers that the strategic asset seeking motives, which is about acquiring international brands and acquiring international technologies, very, very important, especially when we look at investment into Western Europe, North America. Um, does anybody know any of these companies? Well, they use, they're all German companies that have been taken over by Chinese companies. Uh, the left-hand column are all 2005 to, 2001 to 2005 periods, so really very early, and most of them actually worked, the German companies were basically bankrupt. And the Chinese sought to acquire a company that was available cheap, but the financial viability of the operations wasn't so critical. They were interested in the brand and the technology. Right, so they, they were still, uh, but they, these companies are, sorry, this one I think has disappeared. So. But uh, these companies are, have been restructured and they're operating. These are all machine tools, one way of uh, them. These are sewing machines and precision machines. So it's a German material machine tool industry. Uh, later, and, and the acquirers were all state companies. Now we see more and more private companies as well as state companies making acquisitions, and they make acquisitions that are not just companies that are bankrupt, but there's, but uh, still a lot of the German companies are relatively small companies, privately held companies, niche companies. They're, they're world market leader in a, in a very narrow niche, and if I try to explain to you the product, you've probably never heard about it. Um, for the Chinese companies, they're typically much more diversified. They're typically 
in, in the mass market, what they need is a premium brand that allows them to compete internationally. That's why they're so eager of this particular type of company. They're big, but actually they're not very big internationally, many of them. And uh, very often they're state enterprises, but it becomes a bit more mixed on that. Okay, so, so that's the second feature is about strategic asset seeking. The third feature is involvement of the state companies. As I said, private companies become more and more important. But if you look at the volume of FDI, again, the sort of balance of payment statistics, the big volume tends to be associated with the state companies. And that's because the state companies are leading uh, anything that has to do with energy, with raw materials. I mean, the Chinese uh, government wants to acquire resources overseas to help the Chinese development, right? And the Chinese state enterprises are key tools in that policy, right? You can read five-year plan, it's all public, right? The objectives are public, and the Chinese state enterprises have a high degree of autonomy, but they still incentivize to pursue that sort of motives. This is now a list of biggest projects in, in Latin America, but if I took something from Africa, I would find a similar pattern. The biggest are either energy or natural resources. And if we look at other projects, whenever it says raw materials is mostly uh, uh, what it says public, I would call them state. If it looks like a traditional more market oriented or uh, local manufacturing, then you also have more and more private companies. But in terms of the ca action capital inflow, the large volume products tend to be state enterprises. So whether or not state are dominating the picture or not depends on whether you look at the number of projects or the capital flow. Does it matter that they are state enterprises? Now this is a question I did a bit of research on, a, a number of papers. The first paper, we have a data set. We have companies from a wide range of different countries. And we want to know, is the internationalization similar um, or, or different across home countries? And we look at different indicators of institutional uh, development, and we find if it's an institutional advanced economy, the pattern are actually very similar between the state and private companies. But if it's in countries that have weak stock market governance, sorry, all these companies in the sample are listed companies, right? So, so you have listed but state controlled companies. That, that's the question. St listed state control versus fully private. Right? But if you have weak stock market governance, if you have weak uh, rule of law, or higher power, high power distance, right? high power, this is not really a link, it's informal institutions. Right? These conditions mean that those companies have more home market bias, uh, and therefore there is a gap. In, uh, so of course, the, this is the graph for rule of law, but the other two look actually quite similar. Uh, another study, this is Chinese companies. Where do the companies invest? Actually, one issue that Ch uh, Ch state owned enterprises face, especially Chinese ones, and I'm not sure about that applies elsewhere, but definitely Chinese ones, they face opposition in the host countries. Right? There's a big suspicion towards Chinese state enterprises in a number of countries. And we were looking at how do companies adapt to those sort of pressures? So we hypothesize that this uh, opposition is related to, again, uh, rule of law and said shareholder protection. Now we're talking host countries, right? In the host country, the stronger the rule of law, the stronger shareholder protection, the more pressures there are. But also, the more the country is concerned about that state company taking up away some enterprise. Um, technology assets, but we do find support for most of our hypothesis that the state companies adapt their entry mode accordingly. They are less likely to do acquisitions and they take lower level whenever they do take acquisitions. And interestingly, this is again a different paper, different data set. We Actually, the, in this paper, state ownership isn't the main focus, but this is about the strategic asset seeking motive. And uh, here we have private ownership, so it has a positive effect. So the state companies are actually less likely to do the strategic asset seeking motives in terms of technology and um, brand seeking. Right. Let me round up with, or let me conclude with a forecast. The 
before crashes, a lot of those companies we're talking about were crashing. Uh, some of them spectacularly. And that's basically because they are undertaking very high risk projects. That early stage of internationalization might make big commitments. Right? That means it's a high risk project. A high risk project means that there will be a lot of failures. Uh, and a lot of academics are going to shout that their theories were right and counter. But actually, that's misinterpreted. It's about risk taking. They will bounce back. They will stronger. Uh, survivors will be stronger, right? High risk means also high return. Survivors will make a high return. And secondly, there will be second wave of investors who learn from the first wave. And so, emerging market multinationals are here to stay, notwithstanding how many scandals you'll see in the next couple of years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, perspective. We have now uh, Jane Lu, Associate Professor with a PhD from Dell Management at the University of Restaurant uh, Ontario. And she's an Associate Professor here at the NUS. And her articles have focused on outward foreign direct investments by emerging market firms uh, and uh, inter-organizational learning and survival in Japanese foreign subsidiaries and a number of other topics. So, homegrown NUS professor. Thank you. Oh, thank Actually, I'm now at the University of Melbourne, so, uh, so that's why my slides, I do not use uh, either NUS logo or Melbourne logo. I'm on leave from uh, uh, NUS, NUS. So, <laughs> so it's kind of neutral. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, I just changed the topic. Initially, I was thinking, talking about uh, the antecedents of uh, Chinese firms uh, for investment, but then I saw the, the, in the, the, the flyer of, of this workshop is on the implications. Okay, implications means consequences. So I changed this to, to, to the consequences of foreign investment. So what I'm going to look at today is a very, very uh, different type of investment. What I'm going to look at is, uh, is even a new phenomenon. If we say this is a new phenomenon, a, a phenomenon as you said, but this is even newer, it's overseas listing. So which means they are not only making investments in overseas markets, but they are trying to be listed as a local firm in those uh, overseas uh, financial markets. So I worked this paper with uh, my uh, uh, doctor student uh, from, uh, from my US, and she probably will be there in uh, tomorrow's workshop. Okay, so this is an overview of this phenomenon. So actually, we started looking at this um, when the first firm listed in the overseas market, which is Qingdao Beer. So I think everyone knows Qingdao Beer. In 1993, they were listed. So that's the first one we look at. But this is actually quite a substantial phenomenon. If you look at this trend and the number, so that's the data we have collected. Starting from 1993, 10 firms to more recent years. Now it's not um, that recent, but the more recent you can imagine the number is even, even larger. So this overall trend, and it's very consistent with, uh, with uh, the, the trend the, illustrated by the previous two speakers. This is very fast growing trend. So what we're interested in is looking at the, the consequences, right? So because there's so many firms, list, Chinese firms, listed in overseas markets, when you look at consequences, we want to see how they are compared with kind of uh, firms who are purely listed domestically. So we need a benchmark. So the benchmark is the firms who are listed only in the Chinese market. Okay, so because of that, what we are looking at actually is only the, the firms who are few listing firms who are listed in the Chinese market and the listing overseas market. So what I've showed you earlier, this trend, these are the firms, Chinese firms, the listing overseas market. But not all these firms they listed in Chinese market. So that's why if we only look, we look at the duly few listed firms, we only have number 64. It's a much smaller sample we have. Okay, so 
The motivation of this study is we want to look at the role of cross-listing in the process of internationalization, like what, uh, what uh, Professor Maya mentioned, the process state model, right? So we consider this also one stage of internationalization. So internationalization, we know that's exporting, the relicensing or franchising, then also a more serious commitment is foreign investment, right? But this overseas listing, we also can conceive this one also as one stage of internationalization. I'm not saying this should be before or after, but at least this one mode of internationalization. And we also want to see whether firm they can actually benefit. Because I'm primarily from strategy. Strategy always concerns whether this is a good strategy, whether firm can profit from this strategy. So we want to know the performance implications of this strategy. And also we want to see how firm can benefit from this, this strategy. So we want to know the mechanism that actually allow firm to benefit from this strategy. So these are some of the motivations we have. So we look at uh, the research question we have is for firms from emerging markets. So whether the firm, the cross-listing can lead to greater degree of internationalization. So as I mentioned earlier, there must be some connections between internationalization and overseas listing. A firm will not, oh, I want to be listed overseas market. There must be some motivations, right? And we feel the internationalization is one important motivation for this overseas system. So we want to see whether there's any connection between these. And we also want to see whether this processing to can enhance firm performance than pure domestic listing. And whether there are any relationship can be moderated, for example, by firms corporate governance, because there's a well-known uh, theory in the finance or accounting literature about overseas listing, the so-called bonding hypothesis, which means that firms, why the firms from emerging markets, they want to list it in, in kind of more developed markets, one reason is they want to conform to the more stringent regulations in those markets in a sense that they can prove to the others that we, we can conform to these regulations, which means we are of a higher standard. So that's a so-called bonding hypothesis. And how to how to uh, realize this bonding hypothesis is to through the improved corporate governance, right? Because if you want to meet requirements in those markets, say for example US, right? There are certain requirements. In order to meet the requirements, you need to improve your corporate governance. For example, you need to meet the requirements about transparency about certain uh, accounting standards. So that's why we want to look whether this can be moderated by the corporate governance. Okay, so the, the theoretical foundation, I think I can just go through quickly, skip, since we only have 15 minutes. And I think people here, the audience, we're all familiar with, uh, with the, the theory. And we also have two speakers in front of me. So I just go skip this quite, quite, quite quickly. So, um, our main argument is that we feel cross-listing can further internationalization because we perceive the cross-listing as a stage of internationalization. So firm, if they list it in overseas markets, they first of all, they need to know the market, right? So they need to do due diligence about the market. So they should have the knowledge about the market. And this knowledge about this market can also enhance firm's internationalization. And also, by being listed in the market, you have probably have access to the resources, such as financial resources or human resources from the market. This can also further firms' internationalization in that particular market. Okay, so that's why we feel there should be a strong connection between cross-listing and internationalization. And we also feel cross-listing can lead to better firm performance. And why? Because this can overcome market segmentation and raise capital. Because we know in some markets, especially in some Chinese markets, it's well known that market is segmented. For the SOEs, like uh, what, what the previous speaker mentioned, they probably have some preferential policies to have access to the markets. But for some private firms, it's very difficult to have access to market. I interviewed one, uh, one uh, an entrepreneur in Shanghai. He told me, do you know what, what requirement do I need to meet in order to get a capital? To get a loan from the bank, not only I need to uh, to use my own assets as the collateral, but also my whole family, my brothers, my sisters, they all need to use their assets as collateral. So it's a whole family. If he fails, it's, it doesn't not only affect 
him or his family, his immediate family, but the whole, his extended family will be, will be affected. So that illustrates how difficult it is to get a capital for some entrepreneurs. But for these entrepreneurs, if they can get listed in the overseas market, they can overcome such, such disadvantage in the whole market. So this can enhance their firm performance. And this also enhance the investor protection and reduce the age agency costs. So that's the, the well-known, the, the body hypothesis by Coffee 2002. And this also improve the market perception. So if a Chinese firm is listed say, in Hong Kong or in, in the US, and the domestic consumers, they perceive, or investors, they perceive this company of higher quality. Because if they can meet those uh, more stringent standards, they must be uh, better managed. So they may might be able to attract more resources, even from domestic markets. So for these reasons, we feel there should be a connection, uh, a positive connection between cross listing and, uh, and the firm's uh, financial performance. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, how firm can achieve this this uh, this uh, benefit is probably through the improved corporate governance, right? If they improve the corporate governance, and this should also enhance the financial performance. Okay, so uh, so we feel the through cross listing, there'll be some uh, some uh, improvement in the in the alignment between the, the management shareholder and also between the the the, the owners. So this, this uh, enhanced alignment should be, um, improve the firm performance. Okay, so um, for, for the data we have is uh, we look at uh, the Chinese firms listed from 1993 to 2009. So as I mentioned earlier, I showed you earlier, there are only 64 firms that, uh, that meet the requirements of this new listing. They listed both in Chinese stock market and in overseas stock markets, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, US. And uh, our our depend our independent variable is whether it's listed in, in both or it's uh, zero. It's purely um, purely domestic listed. The dependent variable is the degree of uh, internationalization, which is the average of two ratio. One is the the number of overseas subsidiaries and the number of uh, uh, countries they have invested. And uh, we look at the the financial performance, we look at uh, return on assets. So the first one is the first independent uh, dependent variable. This is the second dependent variable, return on assets. And the moderator, we look at two, um, two uh, corporate governance uh, indicators. One is the CEO duality, which is kind of negative, right? Which CEO du du duality is not a, some, something we want to propose that firms should use. And the other is the executive shareholding. So we use the fixed uh, we use two models. One is the, the fixed effect model with the with, uh, inverse uh, Mills ratio because there's some endogeneity issues there. And then we also use the propensity score because uh, we have only 64 firms. So what we have done for the propensity score is we, uh, we have selected another 64 firms with very similar characteristics. For example, in the same industry with a similar firm size or similar firm age. So that's a very popular a method to use the in accounting because when you have very smaller firm, small sample size, you want to choose another sample size that was very similar. So that kind of matching sample, and we see with the what this is called a treatment, the the listing, whether they're listed or not listed, whether we see any effects. So we use the two 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 different types of modeling to test the effects. Okay, so these are the results. So this the what I showed you first is the fixed effect model. So this is the like full this is regression basis regression model. So we have seen I did not I, I do not want to show you that the full table which is too big and the numbers will be too small for you to read. So what I showed you just the summary of the results. So cross listing this is a dummy, and uh, when the firms have cross listed, they do have a high level of internationalization, and uh, we also look at the cross listing if the exact share holding. And that's positive, but uh, with the interaction with the CEO duality, it's not uh, not very significant. Although it's positive, and the firm's uh, performance, and again, it's positive, and the cross listing with the shareholding is negative and not significant. But with the CEO duality, it's negative and it's significant, which means we we do not have good uh, good uh, corporate governance. The, the the positive effect will be reduced. 
OK, so this is from the what I mentioned earlier, the propensity score. So that's the match of two samples. So first we'll look at first dependent variable, which is inter China has actually entered the, uh, you know, the group of top 25 exporters of high-tech products. Whereas India, it still continues to be one of the top 25 exporters of low-tech products. And it, uh, India has not entered into even the group of top 25 medium-tech exports, even on uh, high-tech exports. So this is one major reflection that India's uh, internationalization of our business group has not uh, progressed or reached to any significant extent. You know, when I uh, look at internationalization through exports, I think yeah. the first point to note is that when we look at manufacturing exports and yeah. India's competitive opposition, it is obviously not as broad based yeah. as China is. So, to that extent, right at the beginning, we are expected to probably look at only certain select areas where some internationalization possibilities exist. And I think one of the areas where we get to see that is pharmaceuticals, yeah. where there has been a distinct amount of internationalization. But to take your point and agree with you, that I don't think we can expect a company like the CITC in China to get reproduced in India when it comes to a diverse portfolio of products and services. In fact, to that extent, as such, the integration of Indian firms into global or regional supply chains is very low. It is low simply because the primary commodity that India exports is oil, refined oil products. Right, right. And to that extent, it's a very different commodity composition from China's. So the upstream integration is very low. The downstream integration is relatively high. And I come to the second point when you mention China's high-tech products. I think when we look at China's high-tech products, we tend to overlook one fact that China imports an enormous amount of intermediate products from its neighbors. And these enter China as electronic products. And when they go out of China, they are actually classified as high-tech computer software. But what actually happens in the mainland is very little value addition. It's essentially a limited amount of assembling that takes place. And I think the best example is the Apple value chain, where all the products and parts of the iPod and the iPad actually come into China in almost semi-finished form and are processed out there, purely out of cheap. So I think when we look at high tech, we must take note of the fact that China is actually at a very deep level of integration into what we call processing intra-industry trade. And India is not there. So I think that distinction is important. No, I would like to go one step further. You know, let's give an opportunity for others to come back. Discuss, sure. we don't want to convert this into a debate. Question and answers. Yeah. Any more questions, otherwise we'll take you for into the state-owned enterprises. And as a result of which, they can continue their funding unabated. Whereas when it comes to the Indian companies, they have to rely on resource mobilization from the market. 
benefits. In the past, there have been examples when Indian companies have actually raised resources overseas through GDRs and PDRs and have put that same money into acquisition. But because of the global liquidity crisis, Indian private companies have not had the access. So I think that largely explains the downturn 2010 effort. Broadly speaking, China has a huge budget, uh, sorry, uh, trade surplus, yeah. which is re leads to reserves which are recycled. So the Chinese have to invest overseas, and a pretty small share of that goes to direct investment. Most of it still goes in U.S. government bonds. Right? No idea why they consider it attractive investment, but anyway, that's the way it is. So that's the one thing: it is state capacity. You might politically agree with the Chinese or not, but the ability of the Chinese state to implement the thing that they decided they wanted to do is, is phenomenal, especially compared to India, sure. right? India has a very democratic, and they do what the people want, sort of, but it's not very effective in getting things done, right? It's a state. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, 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 we don't need to go states, to details, but... far reacher than the Indian state in yeah, but, but also in terms of the, the way it's organized, exactly. right? The Chinese are, because it's higher it's uh, effective in implementing I what they I, want. I, I agree with those, and I think there's also another important point to take that I won't hear which show the chain also might be aware. I'm not very sure to what extent there are provincial ESOEs from China, which are featured in the modern list. I think to a very large extent, when we look at CTEC or CNPC or Sinopec and the rest of it, these are all resource seeking ESOEs to a very large extent and coming directly under the administrative control of the central government. Yeah. Are those, they're pro, I mean, state, it's important to recognize state in China is not necessarily central government, yeah. right? Very often they are provincial government, although you're right, I, from all I know that provincial government owned ones are less internationally oriented. Say. Although there are some, and uh, since you mentioned Italy, the, uh, I, I, know what a concrete pump is? Anyway, <laughs> I told you lots of these are uh, very niche markets. It's basically, if you build a skyscraper, you need concrete. And in the old days, you had someone carrying the buckets with the, uh, liquid concrete up. And nowadays, you have a pump to get it up there. Anyway, there's uh, machines to do that. Yeah. Uh, the Germans used to be leaders uh, in that industry, but nowadays, they've been taken over, over by the Chinese. Anyway. There are two companies from the same city competing with each other. One is Sani, one is Zoomline. Zoomline is state, Sani is private. Zoomline acquired a company in Italy called C5 a couple of years back. Uh, Sani acquired a company in Germany last year. Uh, and the third one, Qigong, was on the slide to acquire another German company. Um, so there are pro provincial government, and to some extent, provincial or uh, city governments act entrepreneurial, right? They use state companies, or they think about it like an entrepreneur would in some, to some extent. It's a way for them to compete, so different provincial governments are competing with each other, whatever. So the, the, the provincial government companies have structures that are sort of between state and private, in some ways. One more? The, no, no, repeat questions only after Say anybody else. Okay. Yes, Jane, you mentioned about the cross-listing and you and you basically kind of concluded that that should be considered as one of these stages of internationalization. So I'm just wondering if you actually superimpose the traditional stages model yeah. on the internationalization of Chinese firms, where would you actually place the cross-listing? Would it be in the initial phase uh, when the I would say between the, the foreign direct investments and the, this can be the, either the last one or before the foreign direct. So it's after the company has yeah, actually yeah. had some experience. Yeah. Because there's also discussion about these firms uh, internationalizing quite aggressively. So I was wondering whether you have information or data which suggests that some of these Chinese companies are actually cross-listing uh, quite early on without having without significant having any, any, yeah. without having without significant having presence outside. <coughs> meaning that they, they list overseas without having any, uh, any foreign any, any presence in the foreign market. May, may, without having any significant, just to basically use it as a vehicle to raise some capital. Uh, there, there are firms like that. Yeah. There are firms. 
And actually, uh, just going back to to a, one of the questions you mentioned earlier about the motivations of the firms. Actually, I, I'm not sure about Indian firms, but for Chinese firms, the motivations are very complicated. I have one doctor student who did a did a thesis on the location choice of the the, the overseas. Uh, uh, of, the, of the foreign investment of Chinese firms. Guess what, what, what's the second most popular location of all the Chinese foreign investments? Yeah, Virgin Islands. Virgin Islands. So clearly it's for tax purposes, right? So the motivation can be can be very, very complicated. I think uh, I must bring it. Maybe you can take it up during sure. the tea time, and you have all of tomorrow to uh, to discuss. I need to bring this to a close. Uh, but uh, can I can I offer a kind of a